I'm David Lloyd Glover, and art is my life. I've been an artist for the last 40 years. I've made my entire living working in the art field. When people ask me what my style is, I usually describe it as vivid impressionism, and that's because of the color palette that I use. And it's not so much about am I a landscape painter, a seascape painter, or am I a still life painter, representational painter, I paint all things. There is a Glover signature. Collectors tell me there's something they see in my work, regardless of subject matter. They recognize my use of vivid colors, and there's a real resonance that they feel when they view one of my paintings, and particularly when they own one of the paintings. It has real emotional impact to them. When I was about four years old, my father took me to his favorite movie, and he took me to see Disney's Fantasia, and that was a whole wide world emotional thing that happened to me. You know, being in a big movie theater, the big screen, and seeing this artwork come to life, I was completely knocked off kilter. And my father explained to me that those aren't real things. I thought that, that was a real world. He said, no, those are all drawings. It was that mind-blowing experience that my father took me to that started me on this track of having to create, and I was voracious. I was drawing on everything. So they were getting me big stacks of paper and I was filling them up as fast as I could, drawing everything that I saw on television, like Buck Rogers, Gene Autry, Roy Rogers. I mean, I was just out of my mind. It started there and it never stopped. I'm always thinking of the person who is going to view the painting and what perspective they're going to have on it, particularly if they're going to be the owner of that painting. It becomes their personal possession and therefore their personal vision. The passion isn't to entertain me. It's not about what I think or what I feel so much. I think about what it would affect somebody else and how I could deeply impact their psyche. I want to bring out human emotions in a way that is calming, serene, exciting, that's a brilliant sunset or something. It's all about emotions. That's what paint is. My paintings are really expressions of emotion. The moment that I realized I was gaining a reputation in art was when my Brentwood Gallery was having an exhibition for me and I walked into a very busy gallery full of people waiting to see me. I noticed that Olivia Newton-John was standing right in front of one of my paintings. I'm new to Los Angeles and I'm going, wow, that's Olivia Newton-John. And we're just having a one-on-one -on -one conversation like I'm an equal to her. We live here in Los Angeles and it's the entertainment capital of the world and certainly the creative center of the world. As a result of that, I've created a lot of paintings which celebrate the cultural history of Hollywood with famous icons of American pop culture. did a painting of Django Reinhardt. He was the famous gypsy European jazz guitarist from the 1930s and 1940s. Anybody who plays guitar, that is his hero because there's just nobody else like Django Reinhardt. I finished the painting, I took it in, and the gallery director said to me, dude, that's a great painting, but I don't know who the heck that is. Along comes Kim Campbell, Glenn Campbell's wife. She took one look at this painting and went, oh my God. And she ran back down the street, grabbed Glenn Campbell out of another store, took him up to the gallery and said, Glenn, look at that. And of course, that was it. He fell in love. That is his hero. Glenn Campbell is one of the greatest guitars in the world ever. His hero is Django Reinhardt. So Glenn Campbell bought the painting. I have had a lot of artists that inspire me. I was at a show of Andrew Wyeth. When you see an Andrew Wyeth original painting, you realize he's really an artist's artist. They're wonderful compositions. His sense of light, of time and place are just outstanding. And it's very inspiring. 
Another artist is John Sargent. Although he was a portrait painter of great renown, he was also a wonderful impressionist painter who had great facilities to paint just about anything. His ability to capture a place and time was just outstanding. He would pride himself in painting a whole string of pearls with essentially a single brush stroke. I grew up in a city called Victoria in British Columbia. I lived six doors down from Emily Carr, and she is probably one of the greatest Impressionist painters that ever lived. And certainly in the realm of women painters, Emily Carr inspired Georgia O'Keeffe. And here I'm literally six doors down from her studio. The impact of seeing her work completely floored me. Her paintings were just unbelievable. For the way an artist thinks and how an artist approaches his life, I turned to my mentor, Sid Barron, who became, over the years, what's considered a Canadian national treasure in the world of art and published art. He and I became friends when I was about 18, I think, at the time when I first met Sid. And I went to meet him at a studio, and I went down the hallway to that studio door, and it's blank, glass window, wrapped on the window, door opens, and this guy who looked like Art Carney from The Honeymooners looked at me and he said, huh, what do you want? And I said, well, I, I, my name is David Glover and I'm an artist and I, I really wanted to meet you and whatever. And he reached out and he grabbed me by the shirt and pulled me inside and said, get in here, close the door. And he said, now what was that again? At first he was a little shocked because nobody would ever come to his door. He was a recluse. But shortly thereafter we became fast friends and we became friends for years. And he really was my artistic mentor. He was not an artist who was telling me how to do things technically. It was really about philosophy, and it was about life experience. Sid prepared me for the rejection and sharing his life experience on what it's like as an artist to present your portfolio and constantly being rejected. And for me not to lose heart, expect to be rejected was what he would tell me. You make 10 presentations, you make 20 presentations, but eventually somebody will say yes and you'll be accepted. His guidance is what propelled me to pursue my career professionally. One of the most poignant moments early in my career was I was invited to Tokyo to have a one-man show with an art dealer there known as Art Brilliant. And Art Brilliant was, certainly at the time, the largest art dealer in the world. I went to an exhibition where it was kind of beyond description. There was over 850 people. The pomp and circumstance they put on, the ceremony of having an artist there live and in person, to them was really something big. At that show, I was sold out that evening. It was just over 100 original paintings. I realized I had an awful lot of work to do because I signed an exclusive contract for Asia that went on for the next 17 years. Although it was very difficult to perform at such a high level for so many years, the result to me was that there really isn't anything that I can't do. Living in Southern California gives me the inspiration of light and atmosphere, but my broad, vivid landscapes that I create are from my memories of where I grew up in British Columbia. Those images live with you forever. When I want to create a stunning wilderness landscape or a mountainous lake, I go right back to when I was young. My studio is unique in that I have an eastern exposure. So in the morning, I control my lighting through the shutters, and I'm able to direct the light onto the canvas area to essentially color correct, because I get a very clean color. As the day progresses, I move the shutters because the sun is rising above and then sets into the west. Even when the sun is setting, I get a specific style or type of light that comes in through the windows. When I have one of my paintings sold, I, I never really know whether the same emotions and message that I'm trying to impart in this painting actually transcends to the collector. It's the human part of us that perceives what we see 
and what we feel as art because we can go to that extra level and there it becomes art. My inspiration will come from some emotional and visual impact, and then I will express it in my paints, in my mediums. I want people to see the remnants of the artist. I want them to see a piece of art. I'm telling a story, either it's a narrative story by what you see going on in the scene, or it's strictly an emotional story. It's a response that you have to a particular light effect, a view down a country road, you imagine what's at the end of that road or where it's leading you to, or it's nostalgic. It reminds you of when you were growing up, or it reminds you of an important time in your life. Maybe it was your first romance. You were in a setting just like you see in this painting. So it touches this on a very base level. Art is something that chooses you. Your ability to create in any kind of medium just comes innately, and it starts when you're very young. Certainly in my case, it did. You feel this need to create all the time, no matter what you're doing. But it's not something that I think that you decide one day, you wake up and say, okay, let's go to school and be an artist. It has to come from within. Art is something that's always in your left ear telling you, yeah, it's time to paint. It's time to paint, David. You kind of follow the direction that all forces are leading you in. I have done other things in my life, but art is always the mainstay. It has been a constant in my life since I was four years old, and it's a constant today. Everything I do in my life revolves around creativity.